Welcome back um, to the conference and the, the first panel of this conference devoted to the teachings of the Lotus Sutra. Um, I now have the pleasure uh, to welcome our next speaker, uh, Professor Paul Harrison, who is the George Edwin Bernal Professor of Religious Studies at Stanford University where he is co-director of the Hull Center for Buddhist Studies. The primary focus of uh, his research is Buddhist literature, especially the Mahayana Sutras. Um, often um, the research is based on original manuscripts. Um, his publications include um, studies, editions, and translation of Buddhist texts in uh, Sanskrit, Tibetan, and Chinese. Um, and he's now also one of the editors of the series uh, Buddhist Manuscripts in the Shuyan Collection. Um, and he is going to give a paper uh, titled When Being Original No Longer Matters, Reflection on the Sanskrit Text of the Lotus Sutra and Its Uses. So please welcome uh, Professor Harrison. Thank you very much. Let me start with thanks to the British Library for this invitation and, and to the sponsors and organizers of the conference, especially Melody Dumi and uh, Sia Paniski, uh, who've done a marvelous job. I am the most unlikely person to be asked to talk about the Lotus Sutra. It is true that I wrote my master's thesis on the Chinese translations of the work but then my studies took a different turn when my interest in Mahayana Sutra literature led me to the conclusion that we'd already had far too much of the Lotus Sutra. And this uh, conclusion was sharpened by reading Michael Pai's well-known 1978 monograph on Upaya Kaushalya, so-called skillful means, which is in fact the title of his book. And that book draws most of its material on this key uh, Mahayana Buddhist concept from the Lotus Sutra. It is true that there is a chapter devoted to the Vimalakirti Nidesha and one devoted to the larger perfection of wisdom works, but the overall exposition of that book puts the Lotus front and center for chapter after chapter. In fact, Pai, if I am not mistaken, makes no reference at all to the existence of a sutra actually called the Upaya Kaushalya Sutra. So at that point, and I'm talking about 40 years ago, I made a vow to ignore the lotus and dedicated myself to the effort to broaden the basis on which we study Mahayana Buddhism, bringing sutras into the picture that no one had paid any attention to before. So you might say that avoidance of the lotus sutra became a guiding principle of my academic career. But here I am. So what happened? Well... A year or so ago, two things brought about a change in my attitude. The first was that one of my graduate students asked me to work through some chapters of the text with him, and so I devoted part of a reading class to um, sections of the Sadama Kundarika, the Lotus Sutra. And in the process, I realized once more how interesting and important the material in that text is. And, and this is somewhat related. I, I have become more interested in second-order reflections on what Mahayana sutras are and how they work in exploring their stylistic qualities and literary conventions in a more general way. And one of the, th one of the things that's um, typical of Mahayana sutras is a profound self-referentiality. And it turns out that for this, the Lotus Sutra is a prime example, since no other Buddhist sutra is more obviously about itself than uh, the Satama Pandarika. So approaching the end of my career, I find myself interested in the Lotus Sutra again. I have come back to it in my old age, seeing it in a new light. Yet, even during the years when I was busily ignoring the Lotus, I couldn't help noticing certain things about it in connection with other things I was working on. And one of the areas which has interested me is uh, the, the, the question of Indian anthologies of Mahayana sutras. And, and here are four of them that I've been uh, working on in particular over the, over the last few decades. 
and um, starting with Shantideva Shiksha Samuchaya and then branching out from there. And as I became more familiar with them, uh, I found that for the most part they confirmed my position that the Lotus Sutra was not so important. That is to say that these anthologies paid a lot more attention and drew more quotations and longer quotations from other sutras, including many that are still not well known in Buddhist scholarship. And they referred to the lotus rather sparingly. It is not cited at all in the Jujing Yaoji, which is a commentary which survives only in Chinese translation, cited four times briefly in the Sutra Samucheya, and only one of these citations exceeds a couple of sentences. Three times with different and somewhat longer passages in the Shiksha Samucheya, and then once in the Maha Sutra Samucheya of Atisha. So other Indian commentaries refer to the Lotus Sutra, but often without quoting it. And here it's important to be clear about what the word citation means. Is it a quotation from the text, or is it just a brief mention? There's only one commentary on the text surviving that claims to be Indian, and in fact the work of Vasubandhu, but it survives only in Chinese, and its um, composition is a matter of some contestation. It may well be Indian. These issues are discussed um, extensively in a paper by Jonathan Silk, published in 2001, and a drawing on work by Mochizuki Kaye. And, and Silk's conclusion is that the lotus was not very important in India at all. There's some pushback against Silk's position in James Apple's paper, um, which takes Chandra Kirti, uh, an eminent late 6th, early 7th century Madhyamaka philosopher, as a test case. I can't go into the details here, but we find that Chandra Kirti quotes or refers to the uh, Saddam Pandurika, to the Lotus Sutra, in um, three of his works. But in fact, he quotes a total of six verses, which is not very much. To draw a comparison from my own recent research, in three of his works, he also quotes from the Loka Anuvatana Sutra, and there a total of eight verses are cited. Now, the Loka Anuvatana is a virtually unknown text. Many of you may not even have heard of it but Chandra Kirti quotes more of it than he quotes from the Lotus Sutra. So the situation in India, let's say the jury is still out, and we certainly need more fine-grained studies like James Apple's. Um, but one thing is certain. The Lotus did not occupy the position of preeminence in India, or we might say more generally South Asia, that it came to occupy in East Asia, well as is, as is you know, known to everybody, it became the foundational text for many Buddhist schools like Tiantai in China and Tendai in Japan, the Nichiren schools, and so on into the 20th century in the numerous Japanese new religions. So in those um, schools of Buddhism, the lotus continues to be regarded as the supreme teaching, the final and definitive revelation delivered by Shakyamuni at the end of his teaching career. So this is one outcome of my work on sutra anthologies, the realization that the Lotus Sutra was, comparatively speaking, not very important at the land of its birth. The other aspect of the topic which I became aware of as a translator of Buddhist texts was the strange situation I drew attention to in the abstract for this talk. We have uh, two... Uh, modern translations from the Sanskrit into European languages, Bernoufs in 1852, and then Hendrik Cairns in 1884. And, and I thought when I started preparing this talk that there was nothing since then from the Sanskrit in a European language, but I was wrong. And there are, in fact, two. Dragonetti and Tola's translation into Spanish, and then Luciana Meazza's translation into Italian. So, so I need to correct uh, what I said then, and, and I'd, if there are more and you know of them, please let me, let me know. But as far as English is concerned, the situation remains the same since 1884. We do, by the way, have an English version by Peter Allen Roberts, but that's in the 84,000 series, but that's done from the Tibetan. 
But if we look beyond European languages, we find a markedly different situation. These are the Japanese translations from the Sanskrit text. And you can see there are rather a lot of them. Multiple Japanese translations from the Sanskrit, but still only one English rendition. And this situation is difficult to understand since Ken's translation is often, to be frank, not very good. But when we look at translations from the Chinese, we see a very different story. In his important 1970 bibliography, Akira Yuyama wrote that to that date, no complete translation of the version of Kumarajiva had appeared in any European language, but you can see what happened after 1970. A virtual explosion. And it's an extraordinary situation. Why an avalanche of translations from the Chinese of Kumarajiva in English and other European languages, and this is not a complete list by any means, and nothing from the Sanskrit since 1884. Now, there are a number of possible explanations for this, but one strikes me as going to the heart of, this, of the problem. Kumarajiva's translation is one thing. The text is relatively fixed and stable and unitary. There are some tiny variants, a character different here or there in this or that version, but generally we can agree on what the wording is. This is not the case with the Sanskrit text for which we have many manuscript witnesses from different parts of the Buddhist world which fall into different recensions. And so there are significant differences in the wording. And it can be argued that this situation has produced a kind of paralysis. Which version is one going to translate? And before you sit down to translate, how are you going to establish the text? Now, this is a problem with many Mahayana sutras, they are shapeshifters. They morph over time, and we can see this process frozen at various points by the multiple Chinese translations. So there's no such thing, for example, as the Diamond Sutra in Sanskrit. It presents a moving target. And this brings us to an important point, which is germane to the business of this conference that the prevailing wisdom now among philologists who engage in Buddhist studies is not to prioritize the Sanskrit text as the original and to regard the Chinese, Tibetan, Cotonese, and whatever translations as secondary, derivative, and unimportant. Each instantiation of the text has its own integrity and significance in this protean flow which potentially every Mahayana Sutra is. Hence the title of my talk, When Being Original No Longer Matters. Now that's not to deny that a Sanskrit text may get us closer to the initial intentions of the authors, but when we're speaking of the historical transmission of the sutra, what is important is the text as people knew it and revered it at various places and in various times. So in this light, Kumarajiva's Chinese translation assumes primary significance since for East Asian Buddhists, that was the Lotus Sutra as they knew it. That said, for various reasons, it's good to have Sanskrit copies at our disposal. But with the Sadama Pundarika, we have an embarrassment of riches in the form of Sanskrit manuscripts. This is a situation recently described by a German colleague of mine as a nightmare. A nightmare which, again, our Japanese colleagues have attempted to keep track of in these two very useful bibliographies of the text. So we have four main groups of Sanskrit manuscripts, not three as is sometimes claimed, and you can see the main details there with um, the kind of support that they are written on and their dates, the Nepalese group, the, the so-called Gilgit group, the Bamiyan or Afghanistan group, and the Central Asian group. Right. And the only complete versions are found in the Nepalese group, which date from the 11th century onwards, which is comparatively late. Now the, for the rest, all we have is pieces, right? And sometimes the pieces are quite large, as in the case of the so-called Kashgar manuscript, sometimes called the Petrovsky manuscript. <coughs> 
but, but we have a huge number of smaller fragments from many different copies of the text from the Central Asian group. Uh, if you look at Villa's survey of manuscripts from Khotan in the, in the British Library, you can see that Sadama Pundarika far exceeds any other text in the number of fragments. So one of the things that makes the Central Asian manuscripts different and, 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 and very interesting is that they preserve more traces of the original Prakrit, that's to say the dialect of Sanskrit in which we imagine the work was first composed, and then it underwent gradual Sanskritization over time. So we have all these manuscripts now scattered all over the world in Tokyo and Delhi, St. Petersburg and Cambridge, Paris and Kathmandu. And for Mahayana Sutras, the sheer number of Sanskrit manuscripts, whether complete or fragmentary, is quite unusual. If you look at the Vimalakirti, for example, we have one manuscript. That's it. It stops there, right? So we have, in effect, so much material that it has arguably stymied any attempt to translate it. But a lot of effort has gone to transcribing and editing the manuscripts we have, especially in Japan, and I want to pay tribute especially to the prodigious efforts of Hirofumi Toda, who uh, did a lot of work in this regard. But we still await the arrival of someone brave enough to tackle the task of translation, at least into English. What we do have in place of translations is reproduction of many of these manuscripts, especially by the Institute of Oriental Philosophy in Hachiyoji, Japan. For decades, this institute, affiliated with Soka Gakkai, has been producing deluxe facsimile editions and transliterations of the manuscripts of the Lotus Sutra and sending them around the world to end up in university libraries and the private collections of scholars, a project which began in 1994. I myself, for so many years, a dedicated ignorer of the Sadama Pundarika, received many of them, arriving uninvited and out of the blue in far off New Zealand and now in California. And, and I must say now I'm very happy to have them. So I'm just going to show you some images there. We see a number of, of them in my collection. <laughs> right, so here's St. Petersburg. Here is the so-called Kashgar manuscript. It actually comes from the Khotan region, so Kashgar is a mis misnomer. So it comes from the largest kingdom on that southern branch of the Silk Road. Fairly late date of um, 9th or probably 10th century, and you can see the care which has gone into these um, things. So I took some pictures of the ones I had to show you what this looks like. Right, so this manuscript is the donation of a woman whose Sanskrit name was Suvi Prabha or Jalapunyani with her husband Jalapunya for the welfare of what appears to have been a very large family, especially for the welfare of deceased relatives. So it was an act of merit making. So we should perhaps call this the Suvi Prabha manuscript after the woman who sponsored it. And you can see from the high quality of the ornamental calligraphy that this copy is the work of a professional scribe. This would have cost a bomb to produce. Now, of course, I had to show you one from London. This one comes from the British Library. And here we have it. And you can see it's, uh, the, the reproduction is on the same lines. It's a very nice copy. And then we have some from Cambridge. This is ADD 1682 and 1683, actually used by Hendrik Kern in preparing his English translation. And this is the amazing thing about Bernouf and Cairn's translations. They were made um, not from printed copies of the text, but they were made directly from the manuscripts. This is really wonderful. Without any of the dictionaries or other aids we have at present. So this is uh, the Cambridge one, is 11th century. So one can see the production and dissemination of these manuscripts in these particular facsimiles as a work of merit. 
allowing one to replicate the reading experience of the original if one is so inclined and has the ability to read the varieties of the Brahmi script in which the manuscripts are written. Conditions, by the way, unlikely to remain um, fulfilled by many, if not most, recipients of this bounty. The website of the Institute for Oriental Philosophy and the cover letters that arrive with each instalment emphasize the scholarly purposes of the enterprise to promote the study of Mahayana Buddhism and by uh, providing the materials for new critical editions of the text, an aim which so far has not been realized. According to Oscar von Hinuba, we do not yet have a proper critical edition of the Sadama Pandarika, not even the editions of Ken Nanjo or Ogihara Tsuchita satisfy this criterion. But merit-making remains a palpable concern, as it always has been. As we read, for example, in the dedication printed in the front matter to the British Library manuscript, copy, taken from the lotus itself, for the benefit and happiness of many people. So there's a kind of poignancy about this, each copy of the text carefully enshrined in its own cardboard casket, more likely than not to remain unopened and unread. There's nothing new about this. And so we can see that the Sanskrit text, or rather the many Sanskrit texts of the Sadama Pundarika, are now everywhere, including on the internet. All we need now is somebody to read them, so that the whole text can once again speak to us in its Sanskrit voice rather than its Chinese voice. And I, I keep saying that the Sanskrit text has nuances which may not come through in the Chinese. And let me now give you a single example of this. And we see it here. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned actually only with the bolded words, of the last part of that uh, verse in chapter 13, verse 13, 28. A uh, rough and ready translation of Bernouf, for those of you who cannot read French, goes roughly like this, seated on a seat provided with a footstool and piled high with cotton cloths of different kinds, uh, which he has mounted only after washing his feet and increasing the shine of his face and head by rubbing them with unguents. And you can see that Can has more or less followed Bernouf's lead here, um, having duly washed his feet and rubbed his head and face with smooth ointments. But Ken, uh, as you can tell from the footnote, was somewhat um, bothered by this uh, reading of the text and said, according to the Ten Commandments, those are the Ten Commandments of Buddhism, and not Christianity, uh, uh, the use of ointments is forbidden to the monks, but the preacher need not be a monastic man. Okay, and here we have Kumarajiva's translation. Actually, the verses are sort of all mixed up in Kumarajiva, but just look at that top line there, and, and we see, just for good measure, Hervitz, Watson, Kubo, and Yuyama smearing his body with oil. He should anoint his body with oil, and so on. Now, the, the problem here, if we go back to the Sanskrit, and uh, you can read it again, snigdhena shirshena mukena chapi, it all turns on the word snigdhena. Which, and snigdha has a, a range of meanings, greasy or oily, sticky, slippery, glossy, smooth, affectionate, mild, bland, and so on. And it's obvious to me, at least, that the meaning here is not oily, but smooth and shiny. The preacher of the lotus should have washed his feet properly and he should be freshly shaven so that his face and his head are shiny and smooth, in other words, to present the most well-turned-out uh, appearance. So we can see that Bernouf, in a sense, got the first part of that and then added something which is completely unnecessary and is not in the Sanskrit, right? And so, so we have... Um, we have uh, uh, substance and cures or um, smooth ointments appearing in the picture. So you can see from this one example why we might need a new English translation from the Sanskrit. 
so that people will know that it is not necessary to oil your face and head before preaching the Lotus Sutra, Pache Burnouf and Kian, even less the whole body, Pache Kumarajiva and all his translators. So we really need something, right? And I have to admit, in the last year or so, I've started thinking, why don't I take this on? This is kind of mad, right? But as you may know, we Kiwis pride ourselves on our can-do attitude <laughs> and practical ingenuity in the face of challenges. It's the sort of legacy of our colonial pioneer past, as symbolized above all by Sir Edmund Hillary, which puts me in mind of his first words to fellow mountaineer George Lowe when he and Tenzing Norgay descended from the summit of Everest in 1953. Well, George, we knocked the bastard off, he said. And I'm seriously tempted to do the same thing and to use another of Hillary's favourite phrases, give it a go, if I'm spared long enough, perhaps a project for my retirement. It was tempting to end this talk with an image of the Sanskrit Sadama Pundarika as something like the Mount Everest of Mahayana Sutras with the flags of a small number of nations fluttering in the chill winds sweeping across its summit, some of them rather tattered and faded with the passing of the years, still waiting after more than 130 years for the next intrepid Anglophone climber to make the ascent. But when I went online for an image of the summit of Everest, I learnt that it will no longer do as a symbol of remoteness and inaccessibility. <laughs> this must be the cue of Japanese translators. <laughs> with, the, with the occasional South American and Italian team of climbers thrown in for good measure. Nevertheless, it is still high time for an English translator, be it me or somebody else, to join, to join the queue and to remedy this extraordinary gap in Lotus Sutra studies. Thank you. <laughs>